Dear students, we have reached my favorite part of the class, investing. And we're going to spend a bit of time, quite a bit of time on investing. Chapter 11, on investing basics and evaluating bonds. Chapter 12, stocks. Chapter 13, mutual funds. And then we sneak in a lecture only uh, material on real estate and other investment alternatives. So let's get started with investing ba basics and evaluating bonds. Well, what that book did is they they used to have a cha separate chapter on bonds, on real estate, on stocks, on mutual funds, and they condensed the bonds into the introductor, introduction to investments chapter, and they threw away the real estate and other investment alternatives. Well, I think you know, we need that, so I stick it back in. But in reality, folks, we really only need to look at this one little saying from a gentleman who lived 2,500 years ago. Oh boy, did he have it all figured out. If a little money does not go out, great money will not come in. Indeed, indeed. And we're going to see how that works, especially for younger folks. So let's get started. But first, slide number two. We play a little game that is very popular on television. You may, uh, <laughs> you may notice what we're doing here. We have the answer. The answer is a voluntary tax on stupid people. And you're supposed to come up with a question. What is the question? The answer is a voluntary tax on stupid people? Silly. The question is, what is the lottery? Indeed, the lottery is a voluntary tax on stupid people. Yeah, I know, a few handful of, a hand, a handful of individuals actually make any money and it often ruins their lives. But no, for the most part, it's a voluntary tax on people, mostly the poor, who believe in the economics of despair, that the only way that they'll become wealthy is to invest in the lottery. Well, slide number four. What are the odds of winning? The odds of winning the California Mega Millions jackpot are 176 million to one. But somebody has to win, right? That's what you hear people say. Yeah, but that somebody will not be you. It's too fantastic, folks. It's not going to happen to you. If a person purchases 50 lottery tickets each week, he or she will win the Mega Millions jackpot about once every 50,000 years. So let's see. 50 bucks per week at 10% for 50,000 years. I wonder... We, right, exactly. Slide number five, speaking of odds, astronomers have located an asteroid that is possibly on a collision course with Earth. The asteroid could hit the Earth in 2029, triggering untold destruction and the end of tens of thousands of species, including the human race. The odds of the asteroid hitting the Earth are currently set at about 300 to 1. But those odds will probably lessen as more is learned about the asteroid's orbit. So why aren't the nations preparing for this potential catastrophe? Because it ain't going to happen, and you ain't going to win the lottery. <laughs> so start saving now. Okay, if the asteroid does hit, we'll have plenty of time Plenty of warning for you to go out and spend all your savings on a really big party. Yet, yeah, let's get serious. Slide number seven. Establishing investment goals. Well, you already know the number one financial goal. Which one is your favorite? Spend less than you earn. Live beneath your means. Make love, not loans. Pay yourself first. And let's add frugal, 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 which is a virtue, not a vice as the television wants you to believe right right if you just live by these maxims one of whichever one you want you'll have the necessary funds to start investing so if you follow your, the number one financial goal 
Everything else is fairly straightforward. For each investment goal, you assess the time frame. Remember that? Short term, intermediate term, long term. And then you choose an appropriate investment for that time frame. And this chapter will give you a thumbnail view of each type with an emphasis on bond investing investments at the end of the chapter. And we'll look at some of the others in detail later on. Okay? Okay. So you set your you 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 decide what your time frame is and that shapes what your investments are going to be or your your pool of potential investments. So slide number eight. The book says that these are essential before investing. I don't agree. They are certainly important, don't get me wrong, but I don't think they're essential. They want you to pay off your high credit card debt first. Well, that's an admirable goal and one that should be um, one of your goals from chapter one. But you know, some people, it's going to take them a long time to pay off that credit card and then another merger, emergency happens and so I feel you should start investing now with a small amount and continue to pay off your credit card debt. And the financial darling of the, uh, the uh, people on television and their books and the Susie Ormans of the world is to create an emergency fund that you can access quickly of up to three, six, nine months of living expenses. Look, I don't agree, and I'm not alone. The wealthy barber agrees with me. I simply do not agree with the concept of an emergency fund of three to six to nine months of living expenses. As long as you have access to cash via a home equity line of credit, for example, credit cards at the worst case scenario, there's no good reason, in my humble opinion, to keep 30000 or $50,000 in a savings account earning point zero one percent use that money to pay down the high interest debt because you can always run them back up again right now two caveats you are adequately insured health insurance homeowners car all right and you're not one of these people for whom a for whom yeah for whom an emergency fund is very important Salespeople, self-employed, seasonal workers, people who have a income, an income which is not steady. This is what happens to people in the uh, sales industry, you know, whatever they're selling, cars or mortgages or houses. They have a tendency when times are good to think, oh, this is what my salary is going to be. You know, it bounces up and down a lot, but hey, and they budget accordingly. Bad idea. <laughs> they need a huge emergency fund for when the organic matter hits the ventilating device and the economy tanks and houses aren't selling and cars aren't selling and mortgages aren't aren't being taken out. You understand? So those people, self-employed, they need a big war chest, a big emergency fund. Okay? Okay. Now, slide number nine. Let's take a look at some investment terms. Safety. Well, most people think of safety as a guarantee of return of principal. And here's a cute saying from a gentleman by the name of Will Rogers, who said, I am not so much concerned with the return on my money as I am with the return of my money. And this was, he was a humorist in the early part of the 20th century, after the Great Depression, people were very worried about the return of their money. <laughs> so many people will think of safety as guarantee of return of principal. But we're going to see, what we're going to see is that there are other issues involved, not just getting your money back. Because no matter what investment you choose, there are always risks. And the risk that is associated with very safe, guaranteed investments is inflation risk. Sure, put it in the bank at 0.01%. You're losing money. Well, what are you talking about, Piano? It's still $100, and that actually after one year, it's $100.10, or $0.01. Cent. <laughs> and you say, no, you don't understand. You don't understand. 
inflation went up 2%. So your $100 does not buy what it bought the year before. You are losing to inflation. Interest rate risk. Well, this is uh, has to do with the changing uh, interest rates as they bounce up and down. And we'll see that this is a big risk with bonds. Business failure risk, market risk, those are uh, problems with stocks and, and, you know, and market risk, the housing market if you're in the real estate. And then global investment risk, very subtle, very tricky. The world is global. And there are some people, most notably elderly, who believe you should only invest in the United States. And you say, well, look, you know, we're just one part of the world. They say, you don't understand, son. By investing in Coca-Cola and Caterpillar and GE and Microsoft and Apple, you're investing around the world because they make more money outside the United States than they do inside the United States. And I agree to some extent, but there are some companies that are based outside the United States that are awesome. And personally, I would want to have that ability to invest in companies that are awesome that are not based in the United States. But what is the problem with global investment risk? Apart from the fact that 60, 50, 60, 70 years ago, it really was much uh, less safe, much riskier to invest in companies based outside the United States because they just didn't have the same safeguards. They didn't have the same um, accounting methods and the like, but that's all changed. The problem now is the dollar. The dollar, how the dollar goes up and down um, in, with regard to other currencies is something that affects you when you invest outside the United States. And it's very counterintuitive. If the dollar goes up, you think, cool, that I'm a tourist, I'm going outside the United States, my dollar buys more. That's true. But if you have investments outside the United States, all the things being equal, and they never are, your investment has just gone down if the dollar goes up. It's a seesaw. It's a, a an inverse relationship. Because now it takes more pesos or euros or yen or whatever other currency you're, you're discussing, talking about, to buy those dollars. And some of you have noticed this when you go to Mexico, you when the the peso recently has really taken it on on the chin versus the dollar, dollar has gotten up way high. So it's great for us to go and, and visit Mexico. And in fact, it's a great time to buy real estate in Mexico. But if you had real estate or you invested in in a company in Mexico and you were paid in pesos. Right, exactly. When you go to change those pesos back to dollars, you go, wait a minute. You know? And the same thing is true on the flip side. When the dollar goes down, it makes us makes it harder for us to be tourists outside the United States. But our investments go up. All other things being equal. And of course, they never are. It's just one piece of the puzzle. So that's global investment risk. Now, what about liquidity, liquidity risk. This is important because you say you have a certain investment and it's worth this much, but is it really worth that much? Hmm? You need a ready buyer. And liquidity is the ability to buy or sell an investment quickly without substantially affecting the investment's value. The vast majority of financial investments, stocks, bonds, mutual funds that we'll discuss, those are very liquid. You, you, you want to sell it, somebody's there to buy it. In fact, there's, you look up on the internet, that's what you're going to sell it for. Whereas real estate, oh boy, is not a, a liquid investment. It takes three, six, nine months. Plus, some of those collectibles that you think are worth a certain amount of money, you know, try to go sell them. And there are many different instruments, vehicles, quizzes, and the like to assess your tolerance for risk. Here's one of them from Rutgers University, which is a very reputable university. And it's one of the better ones, but I don't like these. I don't like these because it's not real money. You know, I say 
you really won't know how you're going to react to a market downturn until you have some skin in the game and then you lose some of that skin. It's all well and good to talk about money that's not yours. It's just hypothetical. But when you have a thousand dollars in an account and it goes down to seven hundred, or you have ten thousand, it goes down to six thousand, or a hundred thousand goes to you know eighty thousand, then you you see how you really are going to react, and you know you might you might panic, and and that's the often folks that is the worst mistake you could ever make is panic assuming you've done your research and have found prudent long-term oriented investment oriented investments that should do well over the over the you know the five ten fifteen years or so then don't panic and we'll discuss this later on and we'll see examples of this so what i do with uh with, with people my friends my clients and you know I try to get them prepared for this because emotionally it's like being most people will I will attest to this it, it feels like somebody kicked you or punched you in the stomach when you see that that value just plummet because people are panicking and that's what other people have told me they, they attest to yeah it feels like being kicked in the stomach and what I will do is I will try to try my best to get them ready for it. but when it happens when when the market really goes down I'll call them up how are you doing and if they say, oh, I lost $200, I say, you want to know how much I lost? Um, no, I don't say that. I say, okay, you know, maybe we need to steer you toward more uh, uh, more risk-averse investments that, you know, won't go down as much, but should do okay over the long term. If they say, I didn't even look at it, right? I don't even care. I don't even look at it. I Bingo! You know, you're you're set. Let's 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 make some uh, let's make some investments that are even a little bit more riskier that you know are going to bounce around more, but it should do well better. Should do better over the long term. So you see, it it's there's two parts to investing. There's an intellectual part, which is relatively straightforward once you've had once you've had a good education and you know not something not some scam trying to trying to convince you that you can get rich overnight. That part's fairly straightforward. The hard part is the emotions, how to control your emotions. Because we know going in that if we invest in stocks, there are going to be what are called bear markets. There are going to be downturns. Uh, uh, but when they happen, <laughs> and, they're in the, and the news headline says, is it the end of the world? Run for the hills. That's right. You understand. Exactly. And so um, that's why I'm not a big fan of these things. Although, do 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 take it, do take it, and see see what you think. Slide number ten. Where do I get the money to invest? Well, remember, Mister Confucius, if little money does not go out, great money will not come in. Pay yourself first. Take advantage of employer-sponsored retirement programs. We've made mention of the 401k, 403b. These come right out of your paycheck. We'll look at them in detail in Chapter 14. Take advantage of automatic contributions from your checking or savings account, the Roth IRA, the traditional IRA. Schedule them to occur right after you normally receive your paycheck. It's very easy for those of us who are paid once a month. Once you get used to just getting paid once a month, you set it up for two days or one day right after you get paid. I get paid at the end of the month. Everybody at Southwestern does. And then the next two days, the, the, the second of the next month, I, I have my wife and my Roth IRA contributions come out of the account automatically. So you see it go in and you can't spend it. You only have two days. It works like a pay raise, only in reverse. And we've made mention to this. You'll talk to people who have been out in the home, um, how, how their household uh, run, they're running a household, excuse me, and uh, householders. And they say, you know, I think it's okay. I'm all right. I'm all right. But I just had a 10% raise or an extra 500 bucks a month or whatever. And what happens? They go broke at a higher level. <laughs> so assuming the people, like when my clients or individuals I talk to, whoever, you know, I, 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 people ask me, our students, start with, start small. Start small because you'll 
quickly adjust to that and then you can raise it right yeah because how much do we need it turns out that if you're young and you start early and you're prudent and you invest in long-term oriented investments and don't panic because if the world ends it doesn't matter where your money is it, then you should do really well there's no guarantees but what people will say is you know I I want to you know, wait till I got five or ten thousand dollars to invest. So what? You, when are you going to have five or ten thousand dollars lying around the house, right? Put away fifty bucks a month. Oh, I don't know. How much is your cell phone payment? Well, it's uh, usually about eighty, ninety dollars, but it's only supposed to be forty bucks. I download a lot of ringtones. <laughs> yeah. How much is your cable bill? Okay, enough said. I love these things. They send us in the mail. I keep telling them, don't, we don't even have a television. Don't bother sending us these things. We're not going to buy it. A hundred, only $130 for everything. You get all the porn channels and, and, uh, and HBO. And, uh, um, small amounts invested regularly become large amounts over time. Obviously, the more the better. But it is better to get started with a small amount now than to lazily dream of a day when you'll be able to put away far more. Get started now. If a little money does not go out, great money cannot come in. You can always increase the amount. Every year, add five bucks, ten bucks. One fewer trip to, to five bucks. Or maybe two fewer trips to, to, to five bucks. Especially when you get a raise? Yeah, yeah, not a bad idea, huh? Not a bad idea. And we will see that. We will see, look at what are called illustrations, where you put 50 bucks, 100 bucks a month away, and then we'll see one where we put 100, and then next year 110, and next year 120. Very powerful. Slide number 12. We will end our first presentation of Chapter 11 with a discussion of regular taxable accounts versus tax qualified accounts and there's a there is a, quite a bit of information on this slide so i apologize if you're looking at it on your five inch you know um, some smartphone screen but what it's trying to do let me let me get my cursor in here these are supposed to be containers buckets i don't i mean i'm not that great with the drawing i apologize but 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 the buckets are the type of account. The IRS calls any account that is not sped up, set, set up specifically as something else a taxable account, otherwise known as a regular account. You go down to the bank, open up a checking account. Unless you do something different, unless you show them different paperwork or do something different, you're going to get a taxable account. And what does that mean? Every year, if you make any interest, rent, uh, capital gains, dividends, any kind of investment returns, any kind of investment rewards, you're going to get a 1099 that tells the IRS you made money and you got to pay taxes on that. All contributions are what we call post-tax dollars. Do so you remember Chapter 3 where we um, said how much does it cost after taxes? Right, we've already paid Uncle Sam and we've already paid Uncle Cal. The income taxes have already come out of our, our dollars. The IRS puts no limits on these. There's no limits on the contributions. You have a million bucks, you put it in. You have a 10 million, 100 million, whatever, it doesn't matter. 10,000, you can put it in to the taxable account. Now, notice in the little, this is supposed to be inside. These are supposed to be inside. I apologize if it doesn't look like that, but... In a regular account, you could put any type of investment. Notice I have crossed out a few. <laughs> we will make mention of these later on, but stay away from them. They're dangerous. They're like playing with fire. You might make a lot of money. You probably will, most definitely will, lose a lot of money. So I cross them out. I put a dashed line between around hard assets, which, you know, for some people, we'll discuss these later. Okay, you want to buy gold coins? Go buy gold coins. They're not very good investments, but hey. But notice that 
Stocks, bonds, cash, real estate, mutual funds. Those are not crossed out. Why? Because those are legitimate, long-term oriented investments that should do well over time, but there are no guarantees, and you can lose a lot of money with those, too. Also, so so what did we say? We, no, we, 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 so we said it. We said there's no limit on contributions, there's no limit on the investment types, and you pay taxes every year. Great. Now, how does the other one work? Well, it's not just one. There are dozens of these accounts. Tax qualified accounts is the name that I, the IRS gives them. Most people don't use that term, but you'll hear it bandied about because they, they focus in on the, the, the individual type of accounts, such as retirement accounts, Roth IRAs, traditional IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, educational savings accounts, 529 plans, educational IRA. MSA, medical savings account, then you see a little arrow there going to health savings accounts. The health savings accounts are replacing the MSAs just because they're more flexible. And the IRS has certain regulations. You know, the, the Congress wrote the, the laws and the IRS interpreted them and wrote, wrote down the regulations on how these things work. But the idea is, folks, if you put money into one of these things, the IRS blesses and kisses Domini Domini Sanctus, no taxes. Or tax deferred. You defer the taxes. And we are going to discuss the difference between pre-tax and post-tax in detail when we get to chapter 14. We will also uh, take a look at it. In the face-to-face -face class, we would uh, show a different, show a couple of different uh, account types, some examples. I will have a presentation on the website that shows you those account examples. So you want to take a look at that. Notice that there are fewer options, fewer choices for us. And that's by design. The Congress says, look, stocks, mutual funds, they're already dangerous enough. We'd like you to stick with bonds, stocks, mutual funds, and cash in your tax qualified accounts we don't want you gambling with options with futures with shorting and margining and if you don't know what they are don't worry about them they're just dangerous just know that but at the same time we're also going to put strict limitations on the contributions you have a million dollars you can't put it in your Roth IRA if you tried to the company would probably say Mr. Uh, Smith you know you can't do that if you did do it, the IRS would eventually send you a friendly little little letter saying, you goofed, you goofball, you got to take that money out. So there are strict limits on the contributions. And I asked you in Chapter 3, do you remember what they were? If you don't, don't worry, we'll come back to them in Chapter 14. So you see, in a tax taxable account, there are no limits on investments, no limits on contributions, and you pay taxes every year. In a tax qualified account, there are strict limits on the contributions, strict limits on the investment types, and your money is either tax deferred or, very cool, tax free. And we'll discuss these again in detail in Chapter 14. Yeah, the IRS, by the way, doesn't like the term tax free. They want you to say tax exempt. They just don't like that word free. Anyway, anyway so let's read. <laughs> Although there are many subtle and not so subtle differences, the major differences is how they are treated by the IRS, how much you can contribute, and what you can have in the account. Great. These are the buckets. These are the, the containers. What do we put into the containers? And when we come back, we will discuss the major investment alternatives. We will do it in very limited detail. We will be, we will be flying over the investment landscape at 35,000 feet. Make sense? I hope so. And if this doesn't make sense to you, I want you, I want you to go back and over, over it and make sure you understand all this. Because in our next presentation, we will take a look at the major alternatives and... Don't worry, folks. You don't have to be already. You don't have to have any knowledge of investments. This is a, a we start from the very beginning type of presentation. 
So we'll see you in our next presentation on the overview of investment alternatives.